That mourns in lonely exile Until the Son of God appeared Rejoice, rejoice, Let's say you want to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the flood waters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's release. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavahs for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kavah and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation. But waiting for what? 
In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, at this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kavah for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms, where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kavah for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord, because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sins. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see in any situation how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better, but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea, he lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires, and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus, and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kavah for? You are my yachal. In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believed that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope, and they used the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the El Peace of glory. In both cases, this El Peace is based on a person, the risen Jesus, who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The Apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is, but biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the first Sunday of Advent, uh, the week when we think about and remember hope. When I was planning on what to talk about on this first week of Advent, I was really thinking, basically, what's the point, if I'm honest with you? Um, kind of thinking about how Advent and Christmas isn't really going to feel the same this year. It's not really going to look the same this year. It's not really going to be the same this year. But this actual what's the point wasn't really where I was going with it with that. Um, what's the point question that it wasn't this kind of fatalistic existential crisis kind of question. It was actually what's a sermon? What's a message? What makes a message a message and not just a TED talk on YouTube? What kinds of teachings and messages and sermons are the ones that are going to last and to make a difference and to really mean something to us? And while I was thinking about this, I came across a really interesting piece of writing by a guy called Rowan Williams. He used to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he said this, the best sermons are the ones written on the water. Now he was actually advocating for sermon prep done in the bath. That was his main point in that quote. But what he was actually getting at really was this, that the best sermons 
aren't the ones that last a lifetime. The best sermons are the ones that interact with our lives here and now. And in our here and now time, in our advent time. See, it's not about whether or not you're going to remember some clever sermon illustration tomorrow. It's about whether these words right here and now matter today. So this is the beginning of Advent. And in a probably more profound way than January 1st is, this is the start of a new year. Because we need now more than ever, I'd argue, to centre our lives around the story of Jesus. And so as we start this season of Advent, it's not about a, a countdown to the big day. It's not about eating weird shaped chocolates for breakfast every morning. It's a time to focus on our longings and to focus on our patience. This season asks all of us, what is it that you really want? And how willing are you to wait for it? And paying attention to both of these questions, what is it that you really want and how willing are you to really wait for it? Paying attention to both of those questions during Advent is the thing that's really going to make a difference. It's the thing that's really going to set this season apart from any other. It's going to make a difference in all of our lives. Thinking about this second question to do with patience, we need to be looking for practices that we can adopt, that we can take on board, that are going to help us to wait better. Um, theologian Stanley Harawas, now regardless of your feelings on the American theologian, said this, Advent is patience. Advent is patience. It's how God made us into the people of promise in a world of impatience. And then Richard Raw, again, regardless of your feelings on Catholic Franciscan friars, Richard Raw said this, Advent is always. Patience is always needed. So with all of that said, and thinking of Advent as the start of this newness that we want to grab hold of this year, I want to share a kind of New Year's Day type message with you today. Because I think that Psalm 80, which is where we find ourselves in our reading, Psalm 80, which is part of the lectionary calendar and means that thousands of churches throughout the world will be reading this particular psalm today, I think that it has a lot to do and a lot to tell us about newness. The question that I want us to kind of hold on to and to ask and to wrestle with as we look at Psalm 80 is how can we live and move faithfully in our world in 2020? That's the question, isn't it? How is it possible to live a life as a faithful follower of Jesus in our here and now, right here, right now worlds? Whether that means as individuals, as couples, as families, as a church, as a nation, even as the world? How is it possible to live as a faithful follower of Jesus in our here and now world? How do we live faithfully in the middle of our own troubles, in the middle of our own struggles? See, during this time, it's made it more and more apparent and, and blaringly and glaringly obvious during lockdown and, and within our individual lives that there is a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow and a lot of struggling right now. Who knows what kind of mental health implications all of this will have on any of us. People we know and love have been lost to this fight. People that we know and love and care about have lost others during this time. And I think that this psalm has some things to teach us about those kinds of questions. 
and it's not tidy and it's not neat and it's not clever. It's not going to be this clear message with this, this distinguished three-point sermon. All these ideas aren't going to start with the same letter. I'm sorry, they're just not, because that's not the way life goes. So let's read Psalm 80. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, Shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbours and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea. It shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and wild animals feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. Let your rebuke your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the short time that we have left now, we ask that you speak to us, that the words of this psalm may touch us in a special way for today, that the ideas and the, the themes that come from this ancient poem speak loud and clear and ring through our lives, Lord, as we, we desperately want long for more of you, as we hope for a better season ahead, as we long for a better relationship with you, a greater relationship with each other, a better relationship with creation itself, a better relationship with ourselves. Lord, we pray that we may have ears to hear and eyes to see and minds to understand what you are saying to us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've got five things that stood out to me as I was reading this psalm in the week. Five things that I want us to kind of think about and focus on as a start to this Advent season and as a start to this new year of a season. The first one is DTR. Now you might not be aware of DTR. It's this very millennial kind of phrase. It's one of those modern abbreviations that almost sound like a code that unless you're in the know, you don't know what people are talking about. But simply put, DTR means define the relationship. And this gets used a lot of the time when people are trying to figure out how to be with other people around them. Define the relationship. It's asking things like, what is this? Where is this thing going? How am I supposed to act around this person? And I think that we sometimes need a kind of DTR move, movement and moment with how we view our relationship with God as well. Because a lot of the time we forget that we are creation and God is creator. Or lots and lots of the troubles that we find ourselves in, lots of the confusion, lots of the pain and the suffering that we go through is when we confuse these two, when we mix these two ends of the relationship up. So just listen to these few images that we get from this psalm that talk about God 
and God's people and how to define the relationship. It talks about God is the shepherd of Israel. A shepherd is a, a leader, a carer, a caregiver, a protector, a provider. And it says on the flip side of that, that people are the flock of Israel. We are sheep, we are followers, a collective. We are in need of leading and care and protection and provision. One is the shepherd, one is the sheep. Define the relationship. Goes on to say that God sits enthroned between the cherubim. This is very kingly and royal language. It's talking about authority and reign and sovereignty. And then it says that the people need the might of the king, needing to receive that help, that dependency. They need, desperately need the king to save them. So one is king and one is subject. Define the relationship. It goes on to say that God transplanted a vine from Egypt. So God cleared the ground. God here in this image is the gardener, preparing and caring and tending. And it says that people are the vine that we rely on and we need the assistance and the care and the tending and the pruning of that gardener. One is gardener, one is plant. Define the relationship. In another very well-known verse in Isaiah, um, the prophet talks about God being a potter and us being the clay. Define the relationship. Advent is all about remembering that I am the creature, not the creator. That the shepherd is still protecting and caring for us. That the king is still ruling and reigning in and over our lives. That the gardener is still tending and pruning us that the potter is still working on us and into us and through us. That's how we remain faithful in the here and now world, by remembering that we are creatures and God is creator, by defining the relationship. So that was point one, DTR. Second point is persistence. And just look at verses three and seven and 19 again from Psalm 80. They're going to look almost identical. Three times in this poem, within this psalm, there is this refrain that is repeated. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. This is repeated phrases, almost like the chorus in a song. It's got something that catches us. It's something that hooks us, that everyone can really get behind and rally around and get stuck into. Restore us almost like an anthem. And this re repetition can almost seem a little bit weird, a bit foreign to us. See, we live in this day and this age where we have text and email and alerts that pop up and make those ding noises on our phones. And we exist in this instant messaging world. And the demand on all of us is to reply immediately. And that demand is so, so strong. Like, I'm looking at a text that I've sent, and I can see that it's been sent, and I can see that it's been delivered, and I can see that the other person has read it, so why aren't they replying? Or I've sent a WhatsApp message, and it's got those double little ticks by it, so where is my response? And having to wait, or even having to ask more than once, can feel almost foreign to us today, even rude. But that's not how it works biblically, and it's not how it works spiritually. See, I think that patience and persistence and repetition bothers us a lot more than it bothers God. See, there isn't some kind of shortcut to faithfulness. We get to faithfulness by being faithful. A theologian called Pete Ward said this. He writes a lot about the, the church. And he says that the church, if we want to be faithful, we have to have this kind of ongoing, consistent, persistent, regular, repetitious relationship with God. So as this new year of Advent begins, may we be persistent. Third thing I notice from this psalm is honesty. 
One of the things that I love from the Bible as a whole, but particularly the Psalms in, in particular, in, and in the prophets as well, is that they are brutally, brutally honest. There's no beating about the bush with what, when it comes to the Psalms and the prophets. There's no sugarcoating over anything. This is really challenging. I particularly want to live this kind of thing out in my prayer life. It's one of the things that I'm praying into and wrestling with and struggling with during this time of Advent this year. Now, when me and Kath were little, we'd do this really weird thing. The day we got an appointment at the dentist's, we'd brush our teeth in the morning like we normally would every day. But then... In the dentist waiting room, just before it was our appointment, just before it was time for us to go in to see the dentist, mum would, out of her handbag, get our toothbrushes and the toothpaste, and we'd totter off into the bathroom, in the wait off on the side of the waiting room of the dentist, and we'd brush our teeth again. As if the dentist wouldn't be able to tell that that's what we'd just done. Minty fresh breath and shining teeth at, whatever, three o'clock in the afternoon. Like somehow we go into the dentist and have such amazingly clean, bright, sparkling, fresh teeth that it would be proof that we would never need to go and see that dentist ever again. In fact, the dentist is going to start coming to us so that we can check their teeth. That's how good they're going to look. But thinking back, that is crazy, isn't it? Why? Because the second that the dentist looked into my mouth, She'd have known that I had just brushed them. And she'd be able to see past that fresh brushing to see what's going on underneath. She'd be able to see the fact that my diet consisted of Mars bars and cans of Coke. The dentist can tell. The dentist can see past all of my attempts. And I think that I'd kind of try and do a similar sort of thing when it comes to prayer and God, I think I try and clean up my words. I try to speak differently when it's prayer time. Or I try to say what I think that God wants to hear from me. But God, just like our old dentist, can see past all of that. God knows what I actually mean already. So why would I avoid being honest? Why would you hold back? And then straight after those dentist checkups, we go to Firkin's Bakery for a cake. I'm not sure how that bit links into the, the prayer analogy, but I just thought I'd finish off the story quite nicely in that way. But just listen to the kind of brutally honest words from this psalmist. They say, hear us, listen to me, come and save us, restore us. Shine on us, return to us, look and see, watch over us, revive us. As well, the psalmist asks questions of God as well, which again is okay. How long, this psalmist says, why have you done this? The question is, do we pray like that? And if we don't, then why not? And what would it take to have this kind of honesty in our prayers today? Fourth point, uh, we need to rehearse past faithfulness. I just want to reread a couple of the verses, starting in verse 8. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. What is the psalmist doing here? These are reminders of God's promises. They're not reminding God. God hasn't forgotten. Who are these reminders for? Well, these reminders are for the psalmist and for any other human being who reads this psalm. These reminders of God's past faithfulness aren't just for ancient Israel. They're for us today in 2020. Because we, just like ancient Israel, we forget so easily, don't we? It's part of the reason for all of this. 
As the body comes back together, whether that was physically when we were allowed to, or virtually right here and now, through TV screens and smartphones and tablets, we remember that body and we remember. It's about rehearsing the story. That's what Advent is all about. It's this opportunity, once again, to slow down. It's why throughout this time of Advent, throughout this season, I'm going to be giving these little readings and prayers and reflections and thoughts for the day, each and every day. Not just because I'm bored, not because I feel like I'm, I have to have something to do, not because I really think your YouTube uh, feed would really like to see that, not because I think our social medias need to be flooded with my beautiful face. No, but because I need to remember and you need to remember, it's this constant, ongoing, rehearsing and revisiting God's faithfulness to us. And then fifth and finally, the end. The phrase here is commitment to obedience. Now about 66% of that three word sentence makes most of us squirm, doesn't it? Commitment to obedience. See, I'm okay with the word in the middle, to. That's all right. But we don't tend to like commitment. And we don't tend to like obedience. And the same seems to be true here in Psalm 80. Because over and over again, for 17 verses, the psalmist is asking God to commit. See for it for yourself. The first 17 verses of this psalm is the psalmist asking for God to commit over and over again, for God to act. But then, after verse 17, as we get into verse 18, it shifts, it pivots, and the psalmist flips it onto himself and onto the readers and says, We will commit, we will act. Revive us. Give us what we need and we will call on your name. Then we will obey. Then we will commit. You see, we are empowered to obey by the one we seek to obey. Finally, as the psalmist uses phrases like man at your right hand and son of, the, son of man raised up to describe the kind of king that David is or the king that David should be, we can read these words, we can hear these phrases backwards through time and know that these words are ultimately not about King David, they're about another king, King Jesus, the Son of Man, raised up and seated on God's right hand. This is about who Jesus is, this is about what Jesus does. He's the one who was drawn near. He is the one who has restored us. He is the one who has shone down on us. See, the good news of Advent isn't that we are faithful in the waiting, because a lot of the time, quite honestly, we aren't, are we? But the, the good news of Advent is that God is faithful in the coming. Not that we are faithful in our waiting, but that God is faithful in the coming. Advent is patient. Advent is longing. Advent is expectant. Advent is always. And Advent is about hope, grace and peace.